Have you ever laid in bed uh, worrying about a meeting that you had coming up the next day where you're under pressure to come up with a decision? Maybe the last meeting you had went something like this. One or two of the people dominated the conversation while the others remained mostly silent. There was a, a lack of creative engagement in general. You seem to be revisiting topics you thought you'd resolved previously. Maybe out of time, <clears throat> you tried to summarize the key points and list of things you thought had been agreed to, and then you asked, do I have this right? And at that point, a few people nodded their heads and the rest were silent. But you know, what else are you gonna do? You move forward uh, because you're out of time. Or possibly you had a high stakes meeting coming up where you were facilitating a group of peers. And maybe these were stakeholders, some kind of cross sector partnership or something. In other words, people you're not directly supervising. Right? And you knew in advance there were gonna be some people in the room that had strong and at times divergent opinions. Um, and you remember that the last meeting there were interruption after interruption. And it just seemed to take the conversation in all these multiple directions. And maybe you remember how people in the room were getting frustrated uh, and you were getting frustrated, maybe at some point you decided that you'd better try and get things back on track. But in spite of your best efforts to do so, the conversation seemed to go round and round, little progress was made. Does any of this sound familiar to you? Uh, it certainly does to me, and as a consultant, I say I can see this kind of thing all the time, and it, and it pains me. Uh, and getting to good decisions with groups of people is often a difficult thing to do, even under the best of circumstances, and of course, we're in very different territory at this moment, given COVID-19. Uh, most of us are working home vir virtually. Right? It's harder to be systems focused when we're doing that somehow. I don't know. That's been my experience. Uh, we're not being face to face. And if we're meeting with people, it's very difficult to read body language and read faces. Um, so lack of clarity and decision making is bad enough in normal times. So now it's even a little bit harder. My goal uh, today is to lighten your load a bit. I hope I can do that. Uh, so the focus of this talk is making decisions that bring others along. Um, <clears throat> and some of what I've covered, uh, our covering today, I, uh, I covered uh, in my previous talk, uh, turning tensions and conflict into growth and creative engagement. And I'll be going over some of that again uh, at a less deep level. And it's not critical that you caught that talk to make sense of this one, but you still might find it useful to go back and uh, listen to it later. So I'm going to send you a link in this corner when we're through. You'll like it. <clears throat> uh, and much but not all the content of this talk is drawn from the work of uh, a physicist and Jungian analyst Arnold Mendel and from uh, the body of work of the Lewis uh, method of deep democracy. <clears throat> So you might, some of you might be familiar with this, and uh, this actually pertains to uh, uh, public participation, but it really is applicable to, to sort of any place where we're engaging others in decision making. And so we'll work with it for now. Um, but as you can see, uh, it has a, a scale, I guess, from inform, just informing people to consulting people to involving them in the decision making process and different, uh, you know, determining different options to uh, collaborating with them on, on, in the process more deeply in, uh, in the decision and then empowering. So they're actually making the decision uh, together. And so the question is, how do you know which one to shoot for? And so, you know, maybe the issue or the question you're dealing with is a simple one. And you've seen this before, maybe many, many times. And because of that, you can generally predict what's gonna happen next. All the knowns are known. And maybe you just need to find the right person and make sure that they're on top of it. You know, you can tell someone what to do. That's the command approach. You apply a best practice or they apply a best practice and it doesn't take a lot of dialogue or engagement to, to solve that problem. So why waste time? Maybe you inform people after the fact. Or maybe the situation's a bit more complicated than that and there are more variables to consider here. <clears throat> You're not totally in uncharted territory and everyone generally agrees what the problem is. There might already be some agreement on the broad range of solutions at this point, and perhaps you don't have all the data, or at least you all know what the unknowns are. So maybe you just need to consult a few people before moving ahead, bring in an expert. Maybe you invite some others to influence you before you make the decision, that's, that's totally possible. But and what if, as is so often the case, um, the issue in que or the question or the situation is very complicated or it's complex in nature? Maybe there are a number of overlapping variables or independent or interdependent variables. 
you probably don't know what all the variables are. You don't know what you don't know. The situation isn't stable or it's predictable. It's maybe dynamic, it's changing. There might be multiple possibilities for, for moving forward and there are probably gonna be multiple different people or parties involved that might have very different perspectives, goals, opinions, values, et cetera. So here the command approach definitely doesn't work and the consulting approach may very well not be enough. And in such cases, we're going to uh, involve people or we're going to collaborate with them or we're going to empower them to make the decision. The degree to which you lean to the right end of the, the participation spectrum um, has to do with how many people are gonna be affected by the decision, how much they'll be affected by it, how much they care about the issue, how important is it that those people own the decision? You know, and I'm making a distinction here uh, between uh, ownership, an important distinction, and buy-in. They're not the same. Um, dic dictionary dictionary uh, definitions usually have to do with agreeing to or accepting what others suggest. Uh, of course, there's a place for buy-in, but whenever a situation or challenge isn't reasonably straightforward, or when outcomes matter to others a great deal, or when others have different views from ours, and we need their support to do what needs to be done, then I'm always going to be moving toward collaborator and power, okay? Now, intellectually, because you've listened to what I said so far, um, and about the need to at very least involve people, or better yet, collaborate or possibly empower people in the decision-making process, you nonetheless hesitate. You're in the moment, and you might fall back on old patterns. You might uh, find some old instincts are going to take over. So uh, many modern leaders are still operating from three stereotypical assumptions about leadership. And the first one is the leader knows best. And one very prevalent view is that the leader is somehow supposed to hold the wisdom of, and know what's best for the group, the leader as hero. Um, and maybe be that person who, who is supposed to make the hard decisions, right? And so this is also closely related to the idea that the leader needs to be in control. People are looking to me to make things more stable and predictable. And so I guess I better do that. Um, how's it going to look if I'm indecisive? As business consultant Amanda Fenton says, the problem with command and control is that it assumes the commander knows what they're doing. I, I don't know about you, but I'm just not that smart. So think about this, a recent Harvard Business Review study identified the top three fears of uh, leaders and business executives. The first one is the fear of imposter syndrome. I don't deserve to be here. Uh, next one's fear of failure or indecisiveness or fear of making mistakes. And the third one is fear of being seen as vulnerable. And so when things feel messy or uncertain, these fears, oh, maybe this is counterintuitive, but they might lead us to lean toward more control less vulnerability, less willingness to admit we don't have all the answers, rather than more participation and collaboration. The HBR study also identified 500 negative consequences resulting from these three fears. The number one consequence is bad decisions, that you didn't see that coming. Another stereotype, typical assumption uh, about leadership is that our workplaces are rational places where emotional and interpersonal issues are annoying distractions. But doesn't it seem to be the case though that a lot of the time you spend in these annoying emotional, irrational human issues in our workplaces? And the third one is that we all think alike. Um, this is where organizations talk a heck of a lot. You know, a good game around the value of diversity, but in practice, it seems like a lot of this is lip service. So that those that truly express divergent views or values are often not welcome because they disturb the sense of harmony of the group. But the fact is that the more we manage or lead people and the more we have to collaborate with others, the challenge, more challenging everything seems to get. So we might be absolute geniuses in our initial areas of specialization where we were trained, sales, might be engineering or programming or fundraising or outreach, whatever it is, but now you're working in relationship with people, more in relationship with your peers, your stakeholders, your clients, and in more complex ways than you ever likely did before. And people aren't always rational and they don't often think alike. So let's take this understanding to a deeper level. Um, and for those of you that did attend uh, or that watched the recording of my previous talk, some of this is gonna be familiar. They'll all be going over it um, in a less thorough manner now. 
But to understand it fully, I encourage you to go back to listen to that talk. <clears throat> so most people understand, they're familiar with the metaphor of the iceberg for describing individual psychology. The idea here is that as individuals, we have aspects of our consciousness or experience that we're aware of and aspects that we're unaware of, that we're unconscious of. And what happens above the waterline tends to be more rational and what happens below the waterline tends to be more irrational or more emotional. So when we stay in our heads and we don't let other information in, when we're not being curious or inquiring and when we keep our waterline very high, we're not likely to grow or develop much, are we? In the same way, uh, it's the same between people and, and in groups. There are things that we're collectively aware of uh, because we were there in the group, we're collectively conscious of them when we're present during the conversation, the exchange of ideas and information, and there are things we're collectively unaware of. So when important information isn't shared with the group, and importantly, when people are quiet, their thoughts and their good ideas, their wisdom stays in their head, right? Um, it hides away from the unconsciousness of the group and we miss the potential or the optimal functioning of the group. Maybe what's below the waterline is the minority view. But then again, it's also quite possible, we don't know unless we ask. It could be the majority view. In other words, most people uh, present feel this way. But you as the manager or the facilitator don't know, and that's not good. And here's another reason that keeping the waterline high is a problem. It turns out that there is actually a, a lot that's happening below the waterline in the unconscious of the group. And again, what's below the waterline in a group tends to be less rational and more emotional. And this affects the group but quite often people won't be aware of it or they want to not be aware of it. So when we have an opinion, when we believe that we have something to say or add to the exchange, especially if uh, we're likely, likely to be impacted by the decision, and when we aren't invited to share that, when we don't feel like we've been heard or when we're asked for our opinion or our ideas, and then we find out later that those were not considered or they were discounted, we just don't feel good. We feel frustrated, resentful, might feel angry. And we might not say anything directly. We might very well just go along because for all kinds of reasons that we not, might not feel safe to do otherwise, uh, there might be consequences. We might have reasons to believe that there are gonna be some form of reprisal later and it might be career limiting to contradict or argue with the boss, the leader. But just because we don't say anything, just because we choose to hold it, it doesn't actually magically go away. In fact, it's still there in the unconscious of the individuals and in the group itself. And over time, depending on how much we feel unheard or discounted, depending on how much our views, our ideas, our opinions matter to us, and depending on how long this goes on, things are going to build up. Eventually, one way or another, things will start to bubble to the surface. And we can understand this better through some examples along a continuum of what we call the resistance line. Again, to understand this better, you can watch my previous webinar, Promises the Last Time, I will say that. Resistance behaviors are any behavior that go against the status quo or the decision. Initially, they're smaller and covert, but over time, they become larger and more overt or disruptive. This starts with sarcastic jokes, which unlike normal jokes, they have a little edge to them or a barb to them. Typically happens when people feel uncomfortable directly or openly expressing their true feelings or the, or the issues that they're thinking about. Next, we have excuses, which are normal and often uh, legitimate. If you're paying attention, oh, sorry, forgot this cute little bubble here. Sorry, I'm late. I got caught up enjoying my last few minutes of not being here. Next, we have excuses which are normal, legitimate, but if you're paying attention though, you'll notice you can often see a repeating pattern here that excuses keep coming. Uh, if you do see this happening three or four times, it's quite possible that it's no longer a conscious behavior, that it's, it's not rational. It's, uh, there's some emotional underlying issue that needs to be addressed. Now, the next one is gossip. People share their true uh, feelings, their reactions, um, to the decisions outside the meeting, uh, maybe at the coffee machine. Uh, they might have a damaging effect on the group's morale, but it's also a problem when the grapevine or these back channels become more of a robust communication than the actual formal in-person meeting. Uh, lobbying is also a form of gossip. It's about influencing decisions by trying to get your way before the meeting. 
And then we have poor communication. Uh, this can be everything from not speaking at all, simply not participating or showing up, uh, not speaking directly to others, um, using uh, questions that infer or imply guilt, many, many forms of poor communication. Um, and at some point, uh, things can escalate to, the, to where uh, people just simply stop talking to each other. Entire work teams, they'll work in silos, they'll work in parallel, you ever heard the term parallel play. They might use email or texting instead of direct communication, that often doesn't work well. Or they might communicate through a proxy, and we get to total communication breakdown. And the longer this kind of behavior goes on unattended to, the more inefficient, the more ineffective, the more unproductive um, the organization or the group becomes. And, it can, and it's problematic, it's frustrating, it's expensive. The next one is uh, uh, at some point communication begins to really break down and behaviors are moving from covert to overt and the simple desire to be heard, to be considered reaches a point where people just begin to disrupt the process. They might block or sabotage or sometimes in very subtle ways. Uh, they might put things off, go to snail's pace, take weeks to finish a report, what have you. And the ultimate manifestation of this go slow phenomena is the strike. And this is where people just kind of grind things to a halt until their demands or something close to them are agreed to. And then when people are desperate enough, when they feel that the issue is important enough to them and they simply won't be heard through any other means, they might withdraw from the process altogether. This is the time people leave organizations. So this resistance line is a very useful tool. It's been very helpful for me looking back on all these strange circumstances I experienced in meetings when I ran organizations. And it can tell you a lot about the dissent or the disagreement, disagreement or the level of dissatisfaction due to people not feeling heard and feeling considered. Dissatisfaction and how the decision came about. It can also tell us something about the degree to which others are likely to go along with that, our decision to feel ownership over the decision. So big questions, oh, I'm behind, sorry. Big questions for us today are, how can we keep this resistance line from developing in the first place? Uh, how can we make it as likely as possible that we're tapping into the wisdom of the group? How do we be sure that we're bringing people along with the decision or decisions? And how can we get to a yes that's really a yes that won't be sabotaged later? That's, that's what I call ownership. Uh, Buy-in might not get you there. Okay, so one key way to do that is through dialogue. We want to lower the waterline through good open exchange. And of course, we want to do so as skillfully as possible. And so we're preparing for the meeting. Um, if you're dealing with a rather simple uh, issue and it's not a complex one, or if you're going to a meeting and all you're planning to do is impart information to people about a decision that was already made, this isn't gonna mean much. However, if the situation is more complex and you're having a meeting where you wanna make a decision, then it will. The deep democracy approach is about generating ideas, it's about brainstorming, surfacing different views and perspectives. And so once we're clear about what we're doing, and then we ask ourselves, is the purpose of the meeting clear? Is it clear to everyone present? And is there agreement about this purpose? Every meeting should matter. So let's not get off to bad on bad footing by having a room full of people that don't know why they're there in the first place or don't agree that they're meeting on the right topic. But if you get that right, if you get through that first stage and the purpose is reasonably clear, people agree at, that we're talking about the right things, does that include making a decision? Maybe we're just brainstorming today and that's okay, but if we're planning on making decisions today, is it clear to everyone who will be making the ultimate decision? And so here we're just making sure that the line of authority or the line of decision-making is clear to everyone. So often when you're in a position of authority, you'll decide which method of decision-making you'll use. And of course you have different options. You'll, you can just let people know. You're gonna be making a decision on your own you, the leader or the manager, but with input from everyone, or you're going to be making a recommendation with their input to another body, perhaps a supervisor or a board or a committee or what have you, or the group is gonna be making the decision together. The key is to let them know what to expect upfront and never leave it ambiguous. I see this all the time. In my experience, people generally are fine not being the ultimate decision maker. 
just as long as they understand how the decision is going to be made, even if it's merely to help generate ideas, and just as long as they know their ideas were genuinely heard and considered. Trust along those lines, trusted researcher uh, and social capital researcher Bo Rothstein says, what creates a credible engagement is people seeing themselves reflected in the decisions and actions that follow. So don't ask them their opinion if you're not going to take it into consideration and then loop back to them and let them know, thank you for your input. Here's how it, you know, I'm sorry, your, 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 uh, what you wanted didn't happen, but you can see that we took it into account or look how it did impact the decision. Let them know. On the other hand, when there's no clear line of authority uh, in this case, you know, maybe it's with peers or stakeholders, you're most likely going to be jointly deciding how to decide. And that'll help you avoid turf issues later, right? Power issues that might come up later. <clears throat> uh, pause to acknowledge that everything I just shared applies the same with online meetings as face-to-face -face meetings. Okay, so far. So running or, uh, get my cursor back on there, facilitating the meeting, uh, we're in the meeting now. There are five steps in the deep democracy uh, decision-making model. Four of them are above the waterline. We tend to be more in the business-like rational space. And one is uh, below the waterline. Now, in deep democracy's approach, running or facilitating a meeting that brings others along requires that we as the leader or the facilitator have certain what we call facilitator meta skills. This kind of is like an umbrella over all the steps. And this has to do with the attitude you bring to your tool, the tools you use, whatever tools you use. So for an example, you know, a surgeon and a butcher both use a knife. But if you're going into a delicate surgery, you want the person to have the right attitude toward that use of that knife. And the first one is compassion. Um, Understanding how we all go on the resistance line and why can help us with that. And the other and perhaps more important one is neutrality. This gets us back to the issue of rank. As a leader or a facilitator, you have an agenda, right? You're coming to the meeting with a defined meeting agenda, which you are in some sense driving. And you also have a viewpoint of your own because you're human and it's a viewpoint of some kind. And so therefore, in another sense, you have another agenda. And because of this, you're not neutral. So we are stepping in, we're demonstrating our neutrality by leaning in when we're staying in our own opinion, our own view, and we're leaning out when we're listening to others. In a deep democracy, we call this the neutrality dance. It's both a verbal and a physical gesture at some level. So we're being certain to in no way be physically threatening to others in the room, but I would lean in in some, some way when it's my turn to share my view. And I'd suddenly lean out when I'm inviting other people's views. I'm trying to use verbal cues and maybe physical cues. It's up to you to signal the people what's going on so they understand what's expected of them and, and what you're doing. It's not ambiguous. Now doing this online is gonna be harder, right? Uh, if possible, I'm gonna, uh, all of, I mean, sort of any online meeting is going to be harder when, it, when, when the idea is to have everybody engaged and bring everybody along. Um, and so for me, if possible, I'm gonna encourage you to never hold a meeting that matters online without the use of video. Now, of course, not everybody has access. You're not gonna be able to do it every time, but in both cases, the same applies to hosting any good meeting virtually. You need to slow down. You need to lower your expectations as to how much you're going to get done in a given amount of time. That said, even though it takes time, always start a meeting with at least a short check-in where you hear from everybody in the room, get their voice in the room. It could be as simple as how are you arriving to our meeting today, this morning, or what's left over from the last meeting. Um, and what you learn from this second question uh, can help you build your agenda or refine your agenda, make sure you got things right. But it will also help you to create psychological safety, which you know, I won't spend too much time on this, but there's a great Google study that talks about this and the importance of it. And if you're listening in, if you're tuned in to what people are saying in the check-in, it'll also give you an indication of some of the energy that's in the group. And that might tell you something that it will be important for your meeting. It could impact the process of getting to the decision. 
And if you're starting with a new group, maybe you're launching a new major effort or initiative and you're, maybe you're struggling together as a group, you might want to spend some time developing your group agreements. Make sure they're not just you know, words on a page. They should be meaningful. Um, people need to own those as well. And you might want to revisit those from time to time. How are you doing? How are we doing on our agreements? What, what needs to change? Hold each other accountable. And as a leader, finally, you are going to have to model good communication even better than you normally do. So face-to-face -face or virtual, uh, to do the neutrality dance skillfully, we need to be aware of our rank. Sorry, I'm really off with my slides. So I apologize for that. Leaning in when it's my turn to share my opinion, subtly leaning out and inviting others. So being aware of our rank is interesting. There are different roles we might play in a meeting. We might be the leader, the manager. Uh, we might just be facilitating a meeting among peers or maybe we're a hired facilitator. We need to be aware of that. So if our rank is as a leader, your positional authority, if that's clear, you are the person that's leading, you will tend uh, to uh, lead go first because people expect that from you. And it's, it's case by case. You decide based on your circumstances and how much trust is on your team, but that's often what happens. If on the other hand, you're leading or facilitating a meeting with colleagues or with higher level leaders present, it might be best for you to state your opinion second or not first, probably better to, to uh, hold back and hear other people's views first. And if it's clients or customers you're in a meeting with, let them speak first, right? Start by finding out what they need, okay? So now you're in the meeting and maybe it goes something like this. So we're now into step one of the deep democracy five-step decision-making model. And this one's called gain all the views. You're in the meeting and you state, you know, we're here to discuss X. Um, the, the question of whether or not we should restructure the two divisions or possibly create one division, or uh, we're here to discuss what we're going to do now that we heard we're not going to receive the additional funding we were expecting. Right? Which, what are we going to do? If I'm the manager or the leader, I might lean in uh, with or start with my idea, my opinion. My feeling is that we should be doing X. Now I'm going to lean out and invite ideas and opinions of others. I want to get your thoughts and ideas before I make my recommendation to the executive committee or whatever. What are your views? Something like that. Okay. Now step two uh, is a little different. Okay. Here we're trying to make it safe for people to say what we call the no. This is the alternative or maybe it's the contrary view. It could be anything that might go against the prevailing uh, opinion in the room or the boss's view. It could be a big no, it could be a little no. Uh, and it's not just opposition either. It, it, it also just might be something a little different, a little discordant from the, you know, the theme that's been discussed. Um, someone might put a different spin on the thing. Uh, so for instance, uh, people might go along and a lot of discussion around, yeah, we need more efficient processes or we need to be leaner and yeah there seems to be that's a trend we're going in and someone else might say yeah yeah i think you're, you're right but i think maybe we also just need to do a better job you know treating our people well so it's a little different right and a lot of people miss that because it's subtle but that's also a form of a no um, now step two is is counterintuitive um in most meetings we go into with an agenda we go in with our own point of view most of the time if we're completely honest with ourselves we're really wanting people to say yes. We want people to agree with our point of view or agenda. We want unity, right? Um, and when people, the leader, the manager, the autocrat, the facilitator, they hear a no of some kind, they might very well ignore it. Or they might just uh, not know what to do with it and be frustrated and flustered by it. So they kind of can pass along for that reason. But this not only puts people on the resistant line, resistance line, it also limits the effectiveness of the conversation and the decision-making process. So it does those two things. So this method is the opposite. We lean back into our neutrality and we actively genuinely encourage the no or the alternative view. And at this point, it's very, it's very important that we don't assume people are coming along with us when we don't hear them speak up, because a lot of times we don't. We have a lot of rooms we go into or we're working in and some people are silent and they may nod their heads or they may say nothing. And we assume tacit agreement and this is not good because for some number of reasons, 
Some people might not feel safe. It could be that they're just one of those people that processes slowly or whatever, and we need to pay attention to that. But a lot of the times, people might not feel safe sharing an alternative or a contrary view. And this is probably just based on past experience where things didn't go so well for them, so they're fearful. Again, Bo Rothstein says, what people expect is largely dependent. How's my, there it is largely dependent on their memory of what has taken place in the past. So they come into the next meeting and they're just kind of, they're, they're already conditioned to behave a certain way, to engage in a certain way. And I'm also aware that I'm glossing over the whole issue of rank from the perspective of privilege to a power and privilege. Um, you know, how does my white maleness impact the environment, the process, the safety of others? It's critical to be aware of, of course, and I'm um, gonna have to leave it there today. Suffice to say, though, that when people are in a state of fear, they become myopic and they're not using their full brain, their creativity and their best reasoning. It goes offline. So you're trying to make it safer for them to engage. So you might say something like, uh, I think we may be missing something uh, or I want to check my thinking on this. Does anybody else have a different perspective? Right. Does anybody have something different from X? Or I wonder what are, uh, uh, alternative views are in the room. Does anybody have an opposite or alternative view from mine? I'd like to test this with some opposing views. You're actually being super clear, super specific what you're trying to do. Of course, it may take a while to build trust, but when people see you play this neutrality dance well and they understand how you're using language, it's gonna make a difference and it'll change the dynamics. Uh, here's a good one from author Peter Block. What doubts or reservations do you have? So in addition to tracking the agenda, which we're doing as facilitators, we're also now tuning in our listening in a different way. We're tuning in for that no, All right? We're gonna try different things. We're gonna give it some time. And if you don't hear alternative views, uh, you know they're there in the group. Uh, you could try and create more safety by saying something like this. Uh, you know, uh, we tried this before uh, at my previous employer. We ran into this problem. What doubts or reservations do you have? Of course, this only works if you could do so congruently. You know, you're sharing some reason why you doubt it. So either way, it's a big no, it's a little no, a discordant no. When you hear it, you move now to step three. Um, now, step three is even more counterintuitive, uh, this idea of spreading the no. So we've heard a no. Um, and what we're doing is we're bringing out the differences even more. And maybe even more importantly, when we do this, we help to avoid identifying the no with the one individual that shared it. Because if we don't do this, that person, the person with this view is likely gonna feel isolated. They're gonna feel uh, stereotyped, alone, or scapegoated. And we don't want that. Um, and so we're in effect spreading the no off this person. We're taking it off them, giving them a little bit of ease and a little fluidity so they don't have to own all that. Now, if you provide space for it, you'll find more of that no somewhere in your group, most likely. Someone else might feel maybe exactly the same way, but aren't uh, hesitate to say it openly, or there might just be shades of the alternative view elsewhere in the group. And then we can do this by saying, does anybody else feel a little bit this way? Can anyone else? Uh, relate? Does anyone else um, have that view? Um, and so maybe someone shares that a little bit or a lot, or maybe they put their own spin on it. And, but I know some part of me actually agrees with a little bit of that alternative view, if I do. And so I make it safe by modeling and I, 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 how a part of me feels a little bit this way. I might try to make it safe to say the no by saying, I know where you're coming from, man. Um, for me, it's actually like this. And then I can spread the no by asking, uh, does anyone else feel a little differently? What else? What else? What other views are there? Now, sometimes um, in the course of the discussion, you'll notice the conversation is what we call cycling, which is to say that it's going in circles. We seem to be going in circles around this topic. And remember what I said about excuses. When something repeats itself three or more times, if it continues to continue, 
this could well be a signal of some underlying issues that need to be addressed. That maybe they're more emotional in nature, they're below the waterline, but not as rational. And cycling also refers to the psychological or physical issues, these symptoms uh, that if you're paying attention to it, you might see in a group. And that could be boredom, frustration. People are off doing side conversations or playing with their, their uh, phones. <clears throat> could be irritation, low energy, yawning, other you know, sore backs, headache, maybe you have a headache. And maybe this just means you all need to take a break, but it could be also that there is uh, uh, something else uh, that's not being discussed, that's staying below the waterline. You need to stay in the conversation a little bit longer. You need to go fishing for it. And so if you rush to solutions or a decision here, you could well be missing something that could later come back and bite you. The fish will get bigger. Or you might notice a polarity emerges. There's some tension between two ideas. Maybe it's two clear options with no obvious sense of majority. We could do this versus no, we should be doing this. If so, then we're not ready for, this, for the decision, right? Again, we may need to just stay in the conversation a little bit longer and ask different questions, or we need to just summarize and come back to the discussion another day or something like that. So this is where the, the step five in the deep democracy decision-making process would come in. Uh, it's called the debate, and unfortunately, we don't have time for it today. If, however, there's no cycling is occurring, no polarities emerging. We're on to step four, taking the vote. Now, depending on your rank, you might restate the topic and the options that have emerged and say something like, hey, it looks like the decision uh, needs to be this, or uh, the decision I've come to is this. Who agrees with me? Can I see a show of hands? And this might make some people uncomfortable, but the reason we're asking for a show of hands is because we wanna be sure People don't sit back and then we assume that silence equals approval or acquiescence or something like that. They have to skin in the game. So uh, one uh, vote per person, put the hand up, no thumbs up, sideways down, just hands up or hands down. Uh, one important thing we're doing here is we're actually separating dialogue from decision making. They're not really the same. We want to be crisp and clear to ensure that folks won't get confused so they're less likely to go on the resistance line. So we've stated the decision or the decisions or the next steps, and then you invite the hand vote. If there's not a clear majority, let's say 70%, okay, then you invite people to lobby for their opinions and you vote again, okay? and. Um, <clears throat> before you vote again, you go around to each person who lost the vote and you say this or something like it. I'm sorry it didn't go the way you wanted or I'm sorry you lost the vote. We're going with X, but we want you to stay with us. Critical point. We, we want you to stay with us. What would it take for you to come along with the decision? Uh, what adjustments can we make so it would work better for you? Something like that. So here we're trying to bring the wisdom from the majority or the minority, uh, back to, I'm sorry, from, we want to bring the wisdom from the minority back to the decision, and then we want to vote again, because there may be some important wisdom there. What we often typically do is like, okay, you lose, so we're leaving you behind. That's kind of what happens in our majority democracy. Winner takes all, the, the, the rest of you are supposed to just be quiet and adult and, and go along, but we tend to not do that. So we wanna bring them along as best we can. We might not be able to bring everything they want from their, their view into the decision, but we at least try um, our best. So we're trying to bring them along so they don't just sabotage the decision later on. Now, if you go through this process three times and <clears throat> you still don't have a clear majority, something's probably happening below the waterline that needs attending to, something's cycling there. Perhaps there's a polarity that hasn't emerged. Uh, you know, maybe it's the classic elephant in the room. Either way, you're probably not ready to move toward the solution or decision. Um, this is the whole classic, we've got to go slow in order to go fast later. We want wise action. We don't want just random action. And finally, next to each decision, there needs to be clear accountability, right? Um, so uh, maybe let me just check my time here. So um, I just want to say that uh, in this vote process, uh, so we voted, 
there's not a clear majority. So uh, we go around each individual one at a time. We say, I'm sorry, it didn't go your way. What would you need to come along? You do that to each person. Then you see if you can modify the decision and you bring it back to a vote again. And you do this process twice. If you do it a third time, there may be something cycling. Maybe there's a polarity. You're not ready to move on. You need to be in the conversation more. You need to ask different questions. But assuming you do, now you've come to your decision, then you, you're done, right? Makes sense. Um, and then there needs to be clear accountability, and responsibility, time of output, those types of things. Don't leave the meeting without that. That can become the minutes for your next meeting. Um, if for some reason you won't be actual making the actual decision uh, then and there, maybe it's going to be a recommendation to someone, be sure to close the loop with folks that are involved in that process. Let them know one way or another. It'll keep them off the resistance line. So <clears throat> I realize that every meeting is different and each one of us has, each one has its own dynamics, presents its own challenges. Uh, for instance, in some settings, everyone uh, just sort of piles on, right? It's like, it's a free for all. Everybody talks, they talk over each other. There's lots of no's and it's even difficult to track what's going on. So many different situations. Um, and so I, I'm not proposing that you simply do all these steps, one, two, three, four, in the order presented, and it's like that at every meeting, and everything's gonna be hunky-dory every time. But over time, if you try this, you'll learn to use the four steps in bits and pieces as needed. And over time, if you make this your standard practice, or your what's called a business etiquette, you'll build greater trust, and you'll be able to benefit from the diversity of the groups in a bigger way than you had before, and you'll get to decisions where people really come along with you. And finally, <clears throat> I want to leave you with a challenge. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> I think you probably agree that there's never been a more important time to lean into the polarities that are out there and the tensions uh, in our organizations, in our world. There's never been a more important time to ensure that every meeting is well planned and hosted, where we're truly tapping into the wisdom of the group and that we're doing everything we can to bring others along. So I wanna challenge each of you to try practicing with this at your next meeting or your next few meetings. I'm gonna be sending you a helpful cheat sheet uh, that I hope you'll find useful. I'll send you some other resources and a follow-up email as well. I want, to, I want you to give it a try. And then if you'd like, please let me know how it went. What went well, what didn't, <clears throat> what questions do you have? I'm happy to have, uh, uh, you know, continue in the dialogue with you on this. And so my hope and my belief is that you'll see the difference, that you'll feel more at ease, you'll feel less frustration, better meetings with less resistance, clear decision, wiser action. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, for the wonderful presentation. Um, while you were talking, there were some really great conversations happening on the chat thread. So um, you'll be able to see those once we've closed out this meeting. And we have had a couple of questions come in as well. And we have about 10 minutes. So are you good fielding some questions? I am happy to do that. <clears throat> wonderful. First question is, if you have a policy you need to implement with a small team and a tenured member of the team is notoriously difficult to work with, do you have any tips for decision making with this type of individual? This is a, thank you for the question. It's a great question. It's a big topic uh, and, it, and it gets into some uh, more of Arnold Mendel's uh, interesting theories, one of the things he calls role theory. But, um, <clears throat> Uh, one of the, the ways that, that, uh, that Arna Mandel thinks about this is that um, people take on roles almost as archetypes, partly because of the situation they're in, leader, follower, teacher, learner, parent, child, these are archetypal roles. And people fall into these sort of like hero as, uh, leader as hero roles. And over time, it's very easy for people to project that part of themselves, because we all have a leader and a follower in us. We all have a teacher and a learner in us, right? And so we project that part onto that person. And over time, that it gets very rigid in this person. So just the practice of this. So if your role in that room, maybe you're not the leader, or maybe not the facilitator, you're just a participant, you have the opportunity to begin to start practicing with some of these, with these steps. 
and some of this language and try things like you might hear uh, the conversation going in a, in, a, in a certain way, maybe controlled by an individual. Um, you might hear someone say a, 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 some kind of a no, but there's a possibility for you to say, oh, that's an interesting point. Does anybody feel a little bit this way? Does anybody feel a little bit different? That's one example where you just try things and you try to create more fluidity. And it's quite possible that <clears throat> over time, this person who's holding this role would love to uh, uh, have a little bit less of it. <laughs> um, so that's one, one example of, of what might work there. A lot of times you'll find, I'll see individuals or you'll see individuals in, in groups that even before you start working with a team or as a consultant, I'll have some of the project sponsors say to me, you're gonna, this person's gonna behave this way, you're gonna see this, 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 and I'll go into the meeting and that person is exactly as described. If you look at that uh, resistance line idea, it could well be that this individual has a view, they've tried to say it over and over and, and they're just not being heard. So sometimes uh, when you hear that person share something that feels like a no, that could be an opportunity to say, oh, that's interesting. I felt a little bit that way myself. Does anybody else feel a little bit that way? Does anybody else feel a little bit different? So you're trying to create fluidity for all parties. I don't know if that fully answers the question. Thank you. Um, another person chimed in that perhaps another spin on that previous question and to present it in a broader way is how do you implement policy with a resistant coworker when you are peers and not a direct supervisor? Basically the age old managing without authority question. Yeah, I mean, you know, there could be, there's a, who knows what all the relationship dynamics are there. And at, at the risk of oversimplifying, um, there's a part of me that really believes that this person holds some view or some role that uh, is important to the group, but that person just feels frustrated and doesn't feel heard. Um, and at some level, it's a process of uh, making sure that person feels heard. It doesn't mean you have to agree with everything they have to, they'd said. And, but I've seen this in so many cases where when per, one person feels like they've heard, they, they've been saying the same thing over and over, they have this certain kind of resistance behavior that's blocking a process or slowing it down in some way. When they feel heard, it's almost like the, the air of the balloon just kind of, the tension goes out a little bit. They can relax, the color goes back into their face and it's like now they can be present and participate. So that is from, from, from the, the approach I've been talking about today, that is one response. I mean, it may not get to all of it. Thank you. Um, another question here. What are effective tactics when someone takes the group way off track, perhaps for a singular agenda? Yeah, there's all kinds of things. And I'll, I'll, let's see, I'll try to send you a, a, a simple document on what are called the communication vices and their antidotes. Uh, when someone takes some, something off track in a different direction, of course, maybe they just, again, they have something that some views some they're holding that may be important to the group, but they're not being heard. But it could just be they took it off track. <laughs> I don't know why they're doing it. But that's, you know, as a facilitator, one thing you could do is saying, oh, we were talking generally about this, and now it looks like we're talking about this. And you bring it back to the group and ask the group what it wants to do. What do we want to do now? Do we want to continue to talk about this new thing, or do you want to go back to this? Um, in a lot of cases, you'll see the group will, they'll decide what needs to do. Maybe that is the new topic they need to be paying attention to, or they'll say, we need to stay on this topic. As a facilitator, though, it's probably best that you do not forget that that was, okay, we're going we're gonna to put that one in the parking lot or whatever, right? So that person knows that they were acknowledged and heard, and so you're bringing them along. Thank you. How might we think about this? Uh, how might we think about how this might be different in an online meeting and then deal with that without being seen as the quote unquote leader with rules that quote unquote must be followed. For instance, resistance in the way of not using a camera so you can't be seen or turning video on and off with no explanation. Yeah, and I, that's such a great question. It's so circumstantial uh, in my opinion. I mean, if if, if, there, if, the meeting, if the meetings are important, if the topics matter, um, I, and, and people have the ability to be on screen, I, I think you need to do everything you possibly can to try to coax these people to do that. 
and try to get at the underlying why you're not. And again, you're not always going to get there. And so you, it just it just makes facilitation just more of a skill. You have to you really have to slow things down. You you might have to ask people to speak in in order. Like that's not my preference. I prefer like let you speak when you when, when you're ready. Um, but again, that sometimes that's good because some people uh, are going to dominate the conversation. So so. Um, yeah, it's just when people don't share their screen, if they have the ability to, or if they turn it on and off, and you're in a dialogue. I mean, if it's not a dialogue, if you're not actually wrestling with difficult issues, I mean, it just doesn't matter as much. You're, if you're in, like, my wife is a nurse, and she just participated in a, a meeting at Providence where they were sharing a lot of what's going on at Providence. And then they had a little bit of a Q&A thing. It's not as critical that they have everybody online face-to-face, -face. but when it is important, man, just do whatever you can to get on there. I think we, 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 it makes the difference to see each other's faces. And then the rest is we're still using the same things, like be clear about the purpose of the meeting, be clear about how the decision's gonna be made, like make sure everybody understands what the agenda, um, and then use your neutrality really well. Lean in when it's yours, lean out when you're not, give it some time, don't rush to solutions, make people, really aware, summarize at different points. Here's where I think we are. Is that where people think we are? Okay, here's, looks like we're moving toward this decision. Does everybody see that? Okay, here's the decision I think we're gonna make. Let me do a, a vote, a hand vote. Thanks for the question. Thank you, Paul. That's all the questions that I saw come through on the chat line. Um, if anybody has anything last minute, feel free to send it through right now. We've just got a couple more minutes here. Otherwise, I think we are good to close out. Thank you all for joining us this morning. Thank you, Paul, for the wonderful presentation. And um, everyone be on the lookout for follow-up email, including a link to this recording. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, everybody.